Welcome to, to the Judiciary Committee hearing this morning on uh, Wednesday, April, um, yes, Wednesday, April 14th. My name is Carl Rhodes. I'm chair of the committee. This, this Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include one agenda, the 930 JDC agenda, considering some House concurrent resolutions. Um, Senator uh, Jared Keo Kaloli is the vice chair of the committee. Uh, the other members are Laura, Senator Laura Casio, Mike Gabbard, Chris Lee, Don Mercado Kim, and Kurt Favela. Hang on just one second. And uh, this meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. In the unlikely event, we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties. The committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Friday, April 16 at 10.05 a.m. And public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. With the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it is your turn to testify. There is a two minute timer for testifying. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn, turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding. We remind you the committee has already received a written testimony, but we will try to come back to you uh, if we can. And I think that's it. Let's go and get started. Uh, first up today is HGR 5. HCR 5 creates a joint committee on judici judicial selection to work with the joint, I mean, the Judicial Selection Commission and the judiciary to develop clear written standards for evaluating applications and petitioners for judicial office, developing protocols for training members of the JSC, streamlining the JSC voting rules, creating greater transparency for the rules and procedures used by the JSC, designates members of, of the committee, uh, creates a would create a report by LRB with possible legislation before the 2022 session. First up on HCR 5 is uh, David Louis for the Judicial Selection Commission Steering Committee. Uh, good morning, Chair Rhodes, uh, morning. Vice Chair Akio Hokalole. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, we would appreciate the favorable consideration and passage of this uh, House concurrent resolution so that it is a joint resolution uh, by everybody. Um, uh, this is to improve the joint Judicial Selection Commission process uh, so that uh, we can establish uh, some types of merit principles and various um, uh, improvements to the process to make sure that there are standards, training, and appropriate guidelines for the JSC. Right now, the JSC uh, operates uh, as a constitutional body, um, but it, it is governed only by its own rules uh, that have the force and effect of law. Uh, we think that, that while uh, this insulates it somewhat from uh, political influence, um, that the JSC process can and should be improved uh, so that uh, there are clear merit principles um, that, that are followed uh, and, and pro proper training provided. Um, I'm part of this uh, steering committee that was an ad hoc committee that, that uh, uh, was uh, brought together to improve the process. And we looked at this and, and, and you have my report and my testimony. Uh, we have done some very thorough vetting, talked to numerous uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, prior uh, chief justices, uh, prior judges, uh, the, the American Judicature Society, uh, Honolulu Women Lawyers, and, and uh, prior JSC commissioners, and current JSC commissioners. So we would appreciate your favorable consideration. I stand in strong support. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the JSC uh, with written comments, Rod, Rodney Miley for the Judiciary with comments, Charlotte Carter Yamauchi with the Legislative Reference Bureau with comments, um, Mihoko Ito for Hawaii Women Lawyers with comments, Victoria Anderson in support, and Colin Miwa for the American Judicature Society also with comments. Members, any questions for Mr. Louie? Um, Chair, I have a question. Senator Casio. Um, Mr. Louie, um, just can you mm -hmm. dive into explaining a little bit further what the current role of the House in the selection process of judges? 
Sir, th uh, yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, the, the current role of the House in the selection of judges is a none as far as I can tell, other than the appoint, uh, I, I can't remember if the, if the House, uh, I don't believe the House Speaker appoints anybody uh, to the JSC. Um, uh, the, the Senate uh, obviously has to confirm judges. The JSC selects uh, the people who make the list. Um, and, and then uh, these lists, uh, which is a minimum of four, a maximum of six, uh, then go to either the Chief Justice for the District Court positions or the Governor for the Circuit Court and uh, Appellate Court positions. But I don't believe the House has a, has a, a large role in this. Uh, but, but the House is obviously interested in improving the process. Um, in, in, do you have any thoughts on um, what, what kind of influence this gives the House in terms of um, the way it's uh, written currently in the resolution? Um, I, I don't believe it gives the House any uh, particular influence uh, because the selection is made by... So, uh, the selection of the nominees and candidates is made by the Judicial Selection Commission, which is made up of you know, the various appointees. And, and then the, the final decision as to who is appointed is made by the appointing authority, which is either the governor or the chief justice. Um, so I don't believe the House would have a role in that. The purpose of, uh, the, the, I think the House's interest, at least in my discussions with the speaker and, and the interest of myself and and all the other people on this committee was to improve the process and to make sure that there are merit principles uh, that are followed uh, by the JSC and guidelines for the JSC because currently there are very few. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Senator Favela. So the process that we have now, um, how, how much of uh, Oh, since from now and before, I would have that big of a problem in the process is going how it is now. But what, what is that? Because you keep saying that to make it better. Um, I, I don't understand the, the concept of better if um, everything was going fine by adding um, the house or, or adding other um, entities to it. Um, I just don't know how is that going to make it better. Uh Thank you, Senator. Um, so uh, our belief and the belief of the committee members is that the JSC uh, has worked on, on many occasions uh, uh, very well. However, there have been a few times when the it, it, uh, observers, myself included, have believed that the JSC has gone off the rails. Um, recently, um, uh, for the selection process for the um, um, the Hawaii Supreme Court that came up recently, uh, the JSC um, uh, uh, pushed forward only four names uh, for this. And, and there was a selection and, and I believe it, this is not about the selection of the current uh, Chief ju uh, Justice who was, who was selected because that person is a very fine gentleman, a very distinguished lawyer and would likely have made the list. Uh, what happened, however, was that uh, there, there were a number of highly qualified individuals who were left off of the list, left off the list. Um, this shocked and outraged a number of members of the legal community, judges, lawyers, uh, commentators, observers, uh, myself included, because there were highly, highly qualified people who were left off the list, which raised questions as to why this happened and, and whether or not uh, things had gone off the rails. Uh, and how that could be prevented. Uh, this committee came together. And, um, it's made up of uh, numerous uh, former attorneys general, including the current attorney general. It's made up of, uh, of uh, Dan Foley, who's a uh, retired uh, ICA judge, uh, judge uh, and uh, a, a former commissioner of the JSC. Um, and, and like I said, uh, people, so when we started looking at it, the question was how to improve the process so that we make sure that the JSC uh, adheres to various principles. As we looked into it, it turned out that there really are very few rules. There are 
is very little formal training. There is, actually there is no mandate for formal training. And, and there's very uh, few guidelines uh, that merit principles should be selected or that the most number of the most qualified people should be presented and placed on the list so that they can be uh, given to the appointing authorities. It is my view that the appointing authority is the person who should make this, this selection and that the JSC should not winnow that list uh, uh, to, to be uh, uh, artificially small so that the, the, uh, uh, the appointing authority has less choice. So for those reasons, we believe that the, the um, improvements uh, of this HCR5 uh, would help the process uh, would would um, do that. It will not, in my view, as, as Senator Ocasio had questioned, uh, it will not give, I believe, the House any more influence in the selection. It, it is just that the House is interested in improving the process and making sure that there are guidelines and training that are adhered to. So thank you, uh, Senator. Okay, so the, the, uh, the Senator's resolution where it says two members appointed by the Speaker Two members appointed by the Senate President, a one member by the Governor, uh, one appointed by the Chief Justice, one appointed by the Hawaii State Bar. Is that the is that the is that the version that we're speaking of of it today? Is that the one that, that I, changes? Yes, it has not been changed from what was originally proposed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiyokaloli. Hi, Mr. Louie. The, okay, the recommendations to be proposed by this selection committee include written standards, protocols, potential amendments to rules. I, uh, are these amendments to the, who, um, who ultimately decides on how these changes are made? Are these discretionary choices made by the by the Chief Justice or uh, rules that need to be amended, um, judiciary rules, and, and, and do these potentially include statutory changes? I'm trying to understand once this report comes out and all these recommendations are made, who's pulling the trigger on the changes? Sure. What's the problem? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, and, and the answer is, is that the, the Judicial Selection Commission itself will have to make the rule changes and that those changes in themselves uh, will have the force and effect of law. So, so the way the JSC is set up is, is that it is a constitutional entity and um, it makes, a, per the constitution, it sets its own rules and those rules have the force and effect of law. There are no statutory changes. Uh, I, 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 am, I question whether or not a statutory um, pronouncement or, or legislation by uh, you know this body or, or the house uh, you know would would uh, would be effective because it, the Constitution says that the JSC rules have the force and effect of law so so the trigger would be that um, the JSC would have to amend its own rules uh, but the point here is is that uh, in our discussions with the JSC, um, and, and in our discussions with the judiciary, we have, uh, th there has been expressions of, uh, at least from the judiciary, uh, of, of uh, a willingness to work with uh, the JSC to improve the process. And I, I also receive um, um, affirmations in our discussions from the JS current, so various JSC current commissioners that they were, you know, uh, they are always interested in improving the process. Um, some have disagreed as to whether or not uh, the process needs to be improved, but I, uh, I, I don't think that uh, they are averse to working with the judiciary. So, so the publication of a work product of this committee is really just for transparency purposes. There's no actual lever that would require the JSC to make any of the recommended changes. That is true. Okay, thank you, thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, Senator Casio. Um, yeah, just um, real quick, if, if the House isn't part of the selection process currently, 
Um, what's the justification on your in your mind for including them? Um, just an expression that that uh, of of concern um, uh, uh, by the whole legislature uh, and, and to have input uh, into uh, from various stakeholders. I mean, you've got the bar association, you've got other people who would have suggestions as to guidelines, principles, and process. Um, but that's that's up to you know that's a political question between you and you guys in the house mm -hmm. as to that. But it okay. was a suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I think that's it for me too. Thank you, Mr. Louie, for being here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next rezo, which is HCR 112. This uh, describes the impact that structural, systemic, and interpersonal racism has on public health and provides information about Hawaii history and the specific impact on the Native Hawaiian community. Because this rezo is uh, as much health as it is uh, discrimination, I'm going to turn this over to the chair of the health committee, who also happens to be the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee for further proceedings on this, uh, Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. Let me, I'm trying to pull up the testifier list because I wasn't ready. Okay, uh, first up, Office of oh, uh, University of Hawaii, Dr. Kahulukula. Aloha mai, uh, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Pio Kalole, and members of this committee. Uh, I would like to offer supportive te testimony on behalf of both the University of Hawaii, where I am Chair of Native Hawaiian Health at the John A. Bering School of Medicine, and the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response Recovery and Resiliency Team, where I serve as a co-lead. Both organizations have already submitted written testimony in favor of HCR 112, declaring racism as a public health crisis, which we stand on. However, I would like to add additional supportive testimony at this time for both organizations. Uh, as stated by the Aspen Institute, structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial and ethnic group inequities. It defines dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness or being of the dominant group and disadvantage associated with color to endure and adapt over time. Structural racism is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it has been a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist, end of quote. Structural racism is the root cause of all racial and ethnic inequities in the Hawaii, as it is in the con on the con con continental US. It has caused and continues to cause educational, economic, and social inequities, and the most impacted are Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and Filipinos here in LA. Because structural racism leads to inequities uh, in the social determinants of health across racial and ethnic groups, it is also the root cause for health inequities, such as inequities in diabetes and heart disease. My research, as well as those of other colleagues at UH, has shown that the experience of racism by Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders is associated with an increased risk for obesity, high blood pressure, and depression and a barrier to accessing the needed health care. The American Heart Association, along with NIH, National Institutes of Health, along with the Center for Disease Control, all declared structural racism as a public health crisis. I see that I'm out of time, so I urge all of you to please support this resolution so we can begin tearing down the walls of structural racism. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Up next, Community Alliance on Prisons. Pat Brady. Aloha, <laughs> Kat Brady testifying in strong support of this resolution, this bill. Um, it is so important. We really are grateful that you're hearing this. You know, if public policy was actually made through a public health lens, things would look really, really different. No one would be left behind. The first two pages of our testimony give a lot of data on Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who are way overrepresented in our system. <clears throat> COVID has really exposed the disparities in the health system with data showing that Kanaka Maoli and Pacific Islanders are at an elevated risk for infection, COVID. 
we suggest in the criminal legal realm that you actually look at the report of the h c r eighty five task force which really provides a good blueprint of how we can change the system which is based on structural racism to a system that is more humane caring and actually compassionate and understands that every person who's incarcerated will come back to our community and the way that they come back to our community is really, really important. So we thank you very much for hearing this and we hope that you have the courage and the political will to do some out of self thinking and actually look at our system and decide who should actually be in there and who would be much better off served in our community. As Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So thank you so much for hearing this, Rezo, and we encourage you to pass it. Have a great day. Aloha. Thank you very much. Next, we have Nikos Leverens from the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Good morning, Vice Chair, uh, Chair members. My name is Nikos Leverens from Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Um, we. We strongly support this resolution, but we also hope that this resolution will be a springboard to more concerted uh, legislative action in a variety of areas where white supremacy and structural racism are manifest. This includes our education system, where we have almost one in 10 to K to 12 students being referred to law enforcement. Um, that needs a hard look and a meal tour of action. Um, it also extends to taxation and, and wage policy in the state. Um, many racial minorities, including Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and some Southeast Asians experience poverty rates at a much higher level than other members of our community. Um, that needs to be looked at. We have a minimum wage that's below Arkansas and some other states, and that also needs to be looked at. And finally, we need to take a serious look at substantive reform of our criminal legal system, which disproportionately impacts Native Hawaiians um, who have, especially in the realm of substance use, um, they don't use uh, substances at rates higher than others, yet they, they really feel the hammer of law enforcement. So we see uh, the criminalization of, of substance use and other behavioral health problems as very problematic and it perpetuates cycles of, of poverty uh, and violence and um, poor health. So uh, we have a lot of work to do and it's encouraging to see the legislature take this first step in, in reallocating its resources and its, and its uh, capabilities to promote a more just, compassionate and humane society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have Sharday Freitas in support. Aloha Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Kiohokalole, and members of the Senate Committee and Judiciary. Aloha e ku'u i o keia aina nei. My name is Sharday Freitas, and I submit testimony and strong support. Today, I speak before you as a mother, daughter, wife, Kanaka Maoli, whose ohana's mo'oku aloha goes back to this aina. I stand on my written testimony and would also like to share a personal story while also reminding us of the true meaning of aloha. Growing up in Nanakuli, I was brought up knowing that I could attain whatever I set out for myself. But yet I am speaking before you today from my personal experience having witnessed and the very racism that this race resolution aims to dismantle and eliminate. Having been fortunate to be the first in my family to earn a college degree and then go on to law school only to learn that these laws that I learned about are actually good for Native clients, which begs the question, how is it that the very laws this body creates or has created that mandates funding the Department of Hawaiian Homelands that provides for the protection of water as a public trust resource, but yet there continues to be lawsuit after lawsuit to further affirm these laws. On top of that, it is a result of how racism oper operationalizes that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are experiencing the poorest health outcomes. Native Hawaiians are dying, and that is not a fact. That that is a fact, and not an exaggeration or a sensationalization. And if this makes you feel uncomfortable, it should. We must do better. My life depends on it. While racism has existed in Hawaii for many generations, we continue to hear notions around living aloha or embodying the aloha spirit. Let us not forget that the true meaning of aloha is what this resolution seeks to achieve. 
all of the best qualities and neighbors, caring for neighbors that we've likely all witnessed and have benefited from regardless of race, gender, identity, sexual orientation, or disability. Sometimes aloha is warm and embracing, and sometimes aloha means taking a hard look at ourselves in the mirror and realizing that we have work to do. We need to do better. In closing, I'm here before you today with hope and urgency, knowing that for my keiki, kavana ula kalani, kavaiola, kaina aloha, kalahikiola, and while I literally carry the next generation, I urge this committee to pass this resolution so that our keiki and future generations will not have to carry these burdens. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Next we have Tina Talasosi Posiulai in support. Ah, talo falaba faftai mo la vano ay fayaina fayese mo ni maupuku e winga po ni nei pili. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, for the committee allowing me to um say something to um in support of this um resolution. My name is Tina Talo Posiulai. I work at UH Manoa for more than thirteen years. And I have been heavily involved with um, COVID-19 for Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians. I have a testimony, but I'm not gonna speak on that. Structural racism at UH is real. And that's why a lot of Pacific Islanders wouldn't make it to college. In 1971, UH created a program called Man Operation Manong specifically for, Pacific, for Filipino and Asian um, students. It expanded to Pacific Islanders but I, I am probably the only one at UH that is doing something for this population, helping with uh, outreach and, and parents as well. So if you look at the COVID-19 in relation to public health, the reason why we're, we are un, un, uh, re, our representation, COVID-19 disproportionately affected us because we are poor, because a lot of Pacific Islander students don't make it to college because there is no specific program at UH that can help this population. What can you do as, as, as legislature of this um, state? There has to be something. This um, population needs the support. There is nothing else for this population. And we're gonna continue to be disproportionately affected and die because they cannot afford to live in a house that can house at least four or five people in two bedrooms. So please, I'm urging you, education is the key to the success of this population. It affects our health because we don't have the money. We, don't, we can't even read. The kids graduate at fifth, sixth grade level from high school. I've been there for more than 10 years and I've been begging, but nothing is happening. Nothing is happening for this population. And thank you for the opportunity, but that two minutes is not enough to tell the story about this population. It's devastating. If you work there, it's devastating. It's good for my Thank kids. I have a college education, not for the rest of the PIs in Hawaii. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the testimony we've received from individuals who indicated they would be present. Is there anyone else on the conference who would like to testify? Seeing none, I'd like to note the written testimony in support from the following organizations, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Rainbow Family 808, Young Progressives Demanding Action, Planned Parenthood, the Spore Foundation, American Heart Association, Boy Public Health Association, uh, YWCA at Oahu, Waimanalo Health Center, uh, College of Health and Society, Hawaii Pacific University, the Imua Alliance, Boy Children's Action Network, uh, the Hawaii Public Health Institute, uh, the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice, and about uh, and 35 individuals uh, testifying in support, one individual in opposition, and one individual offering comments. Members, any questions? Okay. Yeah, I have a question, Chair. Um, Senator Pavella. I looked over the resolution and, and it's, uh, it's about time and long overdue, but there's a few things um, for health reasons that is also should, should have been a part of this resolution, and one of them is. Uh, environmental racism and geographic racism. Because exactly what the previous speaker was just saying, uh, Tina, and um, everything that's going forward, as part of the whole health structure, uh, having geographic racism that the people of, of color, the people of, of, of Hawaiian uh, ancestry and Pacific Islanders are all in a certain area of the certain islands. 
And to me, that's a geographic racism. And then when we come to environmental, a lot of the environmental stuff, health reasons wise, is all, again, in those communities, all the pilau of the environmental uh, injustice and racism is in these communities too. So I know, I don't know how we can make any kind of amendment. I know we probably cannot, but I think we should add that because it's a very key part of, of what you guys are talking about for our Hawaii people, Pacific Islanders, health and, and, and growth in moving forward. Thank you, Chair. So S Senator, uh, I intend to recommend to the chair and the committee a number of amendments that essentially incorporate um, several of the clauses from HCR 111, which was the JAPSOM uh, version of this reso, and also from the City and County of Honolulu's Resolution 20-206, which specifically address a lot of the pandemic-related structural concerns that we've witnessed. So we can discuss that later unless um, there are, unless you have a specific question for any of the testifiers. Okay, then on that note and seeing no other questions, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to HCR. 154, condemning all forms of anti-Asian sentiment is related to COVID-19 and urging greater investment in federal, state, and local resources to develop and support community-wide solutions. First up on 154 is uh, Nikos Leverance for Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Morning again. Good morning, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Nikos Leverance with Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. And we support this measure. And the, the thrust of my comments uh, reflect the fact that neither the resolution nor a lot of the testimony in, in prior committees uh, uh, bore witness to the, the legacy of anti-Asian racism in the continental United States with a little bit here as well. And, uh, you know, we need to, to take a, a pause and an inventory of the anti-Asian sentiment that uh, was really exploited by the last president um, calling the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus the, Wuhan flu or the China virus or ascribing a, a, a race or an ethnicity to, to a disease which was just untoward. But if you look at the, the history of Asian Americans, even in, in just California, for example, uh, Chinese Americans, Filipino Americans uh, were subject to you know, a long history of, of, of being murdered for no cause, of being you know, redlined into particular neighborhoods or even particular cities. Um, Asians were not allowed to own property. Um, I invite you to read my testimony for, for other incidences of that. So for COVID-19 here in Hawaii, uh, more must be done to ensure that Asians who are limited English proficient have access to adequate uh, government information and resources. Uh, so with that, thank you for the opportunity to testify again, mahalo. Thank you. Uh, next up is Sandy Ma, Common Cause Hawaii in support. Mike Galoyu, Sr. for Rainbow Family 808 in support. Lori Field for Planned Parenthood Alliance Advocates in support. Uh, Hawaii Friends of Civil Rights, Dr. Amy Agbayani in support. Chris Cofield for New Alliance and for Democratic, the Democratic Party of Hawaii Education Caucus in support. Uh, Hawaii Civil Rights Commission in support. And then there's about uh, 12 or 13 individuals, all but one of whom are in support. So that's all the testifiers we have. Members, any questions for Mr. Leverance? Okay, seeing none. Okay, let's uh, uh, let's go uh, let's go into recess. We'll go into a a, um, a breakout room for a couple of minutes, and we'll come back for decision making. Okay, coming back in for our 930 agenda of uh, the Judiciary Committee's 930 agenda on the uh, House Concurrent Resolutions. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do HC, I'm going to do the decision making on HCR 112 first, which uh, Vice Chair Kiyokalole is going to announce the, uh, the recommend, recommendation, and I will take the vote. Okay, th uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for uh, allowing me to take the lead on this one. 
uh, I'm proposing amendments to the resolution so that it reads as follows, declaring racism uh, a public health crisis, uh, as a public health crisis, whereas public health is defined by the World Health Organization as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. And whereas the World Health Organization identifies the right to health defined as the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental human right, which must be enjoyed without discrimination on the grounds of race, age, ethnicity, or any other status. And whereas racism influ racism's influence on public health has been recognized by the World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Department of Health, Judiciary, Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, Papa Ola Lokahi, Ahahui Nakauka, American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii, and many others. And whereas racism is the belief, theory, or doctrine that a certain race of people are inherently superior to people from other racial groups and are therefore a fundamental determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. And whereas racism influences classism, which, increases, uh, which creates categories of people who are deemed less worthy and therefore available to be exploited for the sake of profit and power. Race is a construct and part of the system of oppression which maintains class hierarchy through an accelerated wealth and health divide. And whereas racism is a fundamental component of economic exploitation, disproportionately negatively affecting a certain demographic of the population, black indigenous and people of color communities that have suffered the most historically due to structural uh, distributional and procedural racism are also disproportionately overrepresented on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Chronic diseases, houselessness, housing and food insecurity, incarceration, and climate change, and the climate change crisis. Whereas frontline communities are typically defined as communities that are disproportionately exposed to vulnerable and vulnerable to health threats, climate-based disruptions, and economic dislocation and that have fewer resources, capacity, safety nets, or political agency to respond to and withstand those risks. And whereas frontline communities often include low-income communities, immigrant and refugee communities, including those with undocumented immigrants, Native Hawaiian Compact of Free Association, or COFA, and Pacific Islander communities, communities of color, people with disabilities, people experiencing houselessness or housing insecurity, the LGBTQ community, as well as women, keiki, kupuna, and anyone at the intersection of these identities. Whereas climate change is the outcome of the degradation and destruction of natural ecosystems, subsistence lifestyles, and ancestral practices due to extractive, violent, infinite economic growth that originates from the exploitation of land and labor directly connected to the disproportionate distribution of wealth accumulation for a small percentage and certain demographic of the population, mostly white cisgender men, and whereas historic and current examples of environmental and economic racism include colonialism, slavery, plantations, the fossil fuel industry, deforestation, industrial agriculture, gentrification, and mass tourism. And whereas racial profiling is the implicit and explicit act of selecting or targeting a certain race or races for law enforcement encounters, policies, and practices, Native Hawaiian, Black, and other Pacific Islander residents are disproportionately the subject of police force. And whereas Though our entire island community has been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, frontline communities and that face pre-existing socioeconomic and health inequities are arguably the largest, uh, the most severely harmed by the pandemic. Whereas the John A. Burns School of Medicine reported in May of 2020 that the highest rates of positive COVID-19 cases in several states, including Hawaii, were among Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander groups. Whereas in May 2020, the Hawaii Journal of Health and Social Welfare stated that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities have experienced disproportionately high rates of COVID-19, and members of these communities are dying at higher rates than their white counterparts across the nation due to structural inequities in access to healthcare and economic security. And whereas in recognition of the historical injustices and ongoing inequities faced by Native Hawaiians, the Hawaii State Constitution and Hawaii Revised Statutes memorializes, memorializes provisions that aim at restoring justice for Native Hawaiians. Whereas the Black Lives Matter and related movements have recently highlighted how individual, institutional, structural, and systemic racism continue to shape our social, economic, and political structures, including through the disproportionate health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic upon frontline communities. Whereas the best, uh, 
to best accomplish the Hawaii State Planning Act's objective of the elimination of health disparities by identifying and addressing social determinants of health, institutionalized racism and racist policies must be dismantled. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives at the 34th Legislature of the State of Hawaii regular session of 2021, Senate concurring, that this body declares racism as a public health crisis, be it further resolved that this body recognizes the importance of operationalizing anti-racist practices and policies through educational opportunities, training and continued learning with national networks of government, working to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for all such as the Government Alliance on Race Equity. And be it further resolved that this body is committed to understanding and addressing systemic racism, is dedicated to collective efforts to dismantle all forms of racism at all levels and its impacts on the delivery and implementation of human and social services, economic development, health care, and public safety, and need to adopt a Hawaii-based, culturally-based health justice framework that will further combat the continuation of racism with policymaking while also promoting racial equity, and be it further resolved that this body recognizes the importance of educational opportunities, training, and continued learning aimed at understanding and addressing systemic racism and of the need for our collective effort to dismantle all forms of racism at all levels uh, and, and impacts uh, on the delivery and implementation of human and social services, economic development, health care, and public safety. We have further resolved that this body urges the governor to declare racism as a public health crisis and to, rec to direct the departments to assess how systemic racism exists in departments, policies, programs, and services, to take all steps necessary to address racism and promoting racial equality, we have further resolved that all certified copies of this concurrent resolution be transmitted to the governor and directors or chairs of all departments. And uh, tech amendments. Any discussion? Okay, uh, HCR 112, passing with amendments. Uh, Chair, will you take the vote? Yes. Uh, I will vote yes. Uh, Vice Chair Jarek Keokololi. Aye. Uh, Senator Ocasio. Aye. Senator Gabbard. Aye. Senator Kim is excused. Senator Lee is also excused. Senator Favela. Yes. Okay. Recommendations adopted. Okay. Thank we'll Thank you. So we'll switch over to HCR 5. Uh, recommendation here is to pass with some amendments. Um, we will reduce the number of appointees to the committee that the Senate President and the House Speaker have to just one instead of two. And we'll add a member appointed by Hawaii Women, women Lawyers. We'll, we'll make the report due 40 days before the beginning of the 2022 session and we'll add a resolve clause tasking the committee with developing strategies with the JSC to improve recruiting, um, both numerically and qualitatively. And um, then I'd like to include committee language indicating to the committee that if they wish to utilize LRB assistance, they will need to meet LRB's uh, internal deadlines. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on HCR 5 recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Rhodes. Aye. Vice Chair Gold, aye. Senator Ocasio, aye. Senator Gabbard, aye. Senator Kim is excused. Senator Lee is excused. Senator Favela, aye. Our recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is HCR 154, condemning all forms of anti Asian sentiment as related to COVID 19 and urging greater investment in federal, state, and local resources to develop and support community wide solutions. Uh, the recommendation here is to pass with some amendments. Just have to find them. Okay, here we go. We'll add a request to, to the, sorry, we'll add a request of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, which enforces federal statutes prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, citizenship status, and other bases that the division identify and analyze incidents based on anti-Asian sentiment that have occurred in Hawaii since March 2020, including incidents of racism, discrimination, hate crimes, and hate speech. And I will also add in your murders and provide comparative information from other jurisdictions and request that they send the legislature their findings at their earliest convenience. We'll amend the resolutions title to reflect this request. We'll delete the paragraph about language access and communication. 
practices as it is tangential to, to the focus of the resolution and will narrow and amend the recipients to, of the reso to the U.S. Attorney General, U.S. Attorney assigned to Hawaii, members of Hawaii's congressional delegation and chair of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, and there'll be text as well. Questions or concerns? Chairman Rhodes, I would just like to speak to the record um, that I think we would really sorely fail if we don't address, you know, in the wake of killings of killing of a 16 year old Micronesian boy that we don't address the disproportionate representation of Asian Pacific Islanders as victims. And my suggestion in this respect is that in the Be It Resolved, we also, um, in the Be It Resolved section that um, all federal law enforcement officials working with state and local officials are urged to investigate the dif disproportionate killings of Asian Pacific Islanders by law enforcement. Um, I just think that the timing is. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 can, I, I think we can, I can agree to that amendment. That's fine. Well, but what I did also change the request of the Civil Rights Commission. So we're asking yes. specifically about murderers, but yes. I'll, I'll accept that amendment. I, I, and I did, um, I did pick up on that. You, you had said murder, but it's specifically about law enforcement as well. So murder, yes, it's very important, but, and of course that then it just becomes a whole, uh, whether they get charged with murder, right, is, is going to determine whether it's considered murder. And so I'm specifically speaking okay, to- I can, I can make it homicide. We'll change it to right. homicide. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically- I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, accept, I'll accept your amendment. That's fine. Okay. What you just described okay. is fine with me. Okay. I'm specifically talking about killings by law enforcement, not necessarily if it's actually processed as murder or homicide. So- well, no, homicide is, the generic, homicide is the generic term. That means a human was killed. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rhodes. Just... Any other questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on HCR 154, the recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Ocasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Excuse, Senator Lee? Excuse, Senator Favell. Aye. Chair recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you members. That concludes our business for today. We will have a, a decision-making hearing on Friday at 10 o'clock. And then we, to, then we get to do conference. So thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Mahalo.